So I'm going to introduce our speaker today. So Kelly Gerling is normally behind the video up there in the balcony, but today he's going to be up front here. Uh, the program says he's a reverend. He's not a reverend, but he is a Dr. Kelly Gerling. He has a PhD in clinical psychology. I met Kelly in 1981. He was my instructor at Ottawa University, and he is a professional coach and has worked with individuals and organizations for many decades. He's also extremely passionate about the earth and uh, current events. So join me in welcoming Kelly Gerling. Thank you for that introduction, Karen. When I think about Earth Day, at the risk of being obvious, when we think about the Earth, what is extraordinary to me is this astonishing fact. A star blew up, a nebula formed, our solar system formed, and somehow, life developed on our planet, and then our species developed. What is the end result? It's kind of from the mystical tradition. Each of us, and humanity itself, is a way the entire universe has come to know itself. So that means we're important in that way. And the Earth is important. Last year, on April 22nd, I had the privilege of offering a talk on Earth Day as well. And I took a medical approach. We've got to diagnose the situation, create a prognosis for treatment, and then make a treatment plan, implement the treatment. Well, in short, what is the diagnosis? The situation is grim because of the momentum of civilization poisoning the very planet on which each of us depends. The prognosis, though, is pretty simple. We need to create a World War II type of mass mobilization towards zero carbon clean infrastructure while employing everyone, which happened during World War II, to bring about prosperity for all Americans and all people everywhere. It's just that. <laughs> it's just that little thing. And so this vision, you know, it needs, that's a little long and wordy, so we need a condensed, crystallized form of thought to encapsulate the mission we have to deal with this crisis. And so I've searched, and I came up with five words from the most authoritative source we can imagine. And it's in your program. I'm going to pull out <clears throat> a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. He wrote this in his last book, published after he died, called A Testament of Hope. And buried inside the book is this statement. The black revolution is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic, rather than superficial, flaws and suggests, and these are the five words, that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. The radical reconstruction of society itself. Now that's just huge. <laughs> Emotionally, when we are facing this, what I would call the existential crisis, 
if we think of it very long, we can get mired in hopelessness. So the remedy for hopelessness has got to be some sort of vision like those five words. But in order to pull off that, we need more. We need more detail. Otherwise, it's just a slogan. So I pulled out another quote from, again, another authoritative source. Those of us who are in new thought, or those of us who value new thinking, we need new new thought and new new thinking. And uh, Einstein, in 1946, made this statement, which he subsequently came back and explained in more detail. I've got both parts of it here. A new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move to higher levels. The human race finds itself in a new habitat to which it must adapt its thinking. Today, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has placed the doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight. So we have a risk of nuclear war, and we have a risk of environmental catastrophe. That is the existential global crisis. So we are called to action. We are calling, it's not just Dr. King and Einstein, it's also Karen. So on Easter, Karen concluded, calling us. We are called to rise up. We are called to live this incredible life that we've been given. And we are called to express our divinity. So throw away the stone, move it out of the way, and step into the light. And earlier on Palm Sunday, referring to what I think is crucial to understand, to get over any sense of individual hopelessness, is the necessity of doing things in groups. So remember those who, who heard her talk on Palm Sunday, the reference to all the people that came together to make the photo of the black hole. And Karen said, it is no longer just one person, right? It's all of us together, forging together to discover these new solutions and these new amazing insights that one person can't do. So it's another step forward on that path that we must take. So that's what's in front of us. What is our annual theme, impermanence? Well, we're going to deconstruct this building and reconstruct another one. So we're inside of impermanence. But that, what we're doing with the building, is a metaphor for what we must do globally what we must do, what we can do nationally as Americans, as citizens of the most powerful country in the history of the world. We're uniquely privileged with an opportunity, should we take it, to exercise control on the planet. <clears throat> and the situation is such with impermanence that there isn't a choice of maintaining the status quo. We cannot negotiate with physics and biology and ecology uh, that's a given. If anybody who watched the Game of Thrones, has anybody ever watched that? Uh, it, it's, um, you can't negotiate with the, the White Walkers and the Night King. Uh, they're coming. Winter is coming. In this case, we have, have to do something. So the choices are keep the status quo, and the existential crisis will consume us. We will plunge into the abyss of converging problems that constitute the existential crisis. That's the current trajectory. Call it A. What's B? B is the radical reconstruction of society. B is doing what Einstein said, thinking in new types of ways. B is what Karen is calling us to do. There is uh, an activist. How many have heard of Greta Thunberg, the teenage girl from Sweden? I don't know how she managed to pull it off. She spoke to the European Parliament. She spoke to the House of Commons. I've never done either one of those things. Uh, that's really cool. She also spoke to a group called Extinction Rebellion, which are pursuing 
creating the mobilization for the political will for this issue, the issue. And she said, humanity is now standing at a crossroads. That's A and B. We must now decide which path we want to take. We are now facing an existential crisis. So note that phrase, existential crisis, because it's the essence of what I want to talk about in Pull Back the Curtain, the title of this talk. The typical phrase is climate change. And climate change is an Orwellian understatement of the problem. It's, it's like saying World War II is the Battle of the Bulge. It's no, it was more than that. And the problem, the existential crisis, is much more than climate change, although climate change is vital as something to prevent. But there are other parts. Climate has nothing to do with ocean acidification or melting glaciers or rising seas. Climate is a during weather. It's one little part of it. It's an important part. So existential crisis is a bigger, more appropriate category because existential means life threatening, threatening the existence of civilization, of humanity. So my hat's off to her for reframing and creating a new definition for the crisis, uh, which I think is consistent with what we need to do. So uh, with that in mind, um, what I would like to do is uh, talk a little bit about modern scripture, 20th century scripture. So the Wizard of Oz is a story we all know, right? How, how many people know the Wizard of Oz? here in this room, everybody. So I grew up in Kansas. So <laughs> as a kid, I thought, it's on every year. It must be just for us in Kansas. And it was only when I became an adult and began to travel that I realized that everybody watched The Wizard of Oz everywhere in the world, at least the English-speaking world. And so when I had the fortune to travel you know, to work in different places, New Zealand, Australia, South America, Mexico, other places. People say, where are you from? I say, I'm from America, uh, Kansas. And they'd go, Dorothy? It's the only thing they could think of. Like, she was my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so I developed a, a little joke. I said, yes, Dorothy's from Kansas, too. Dorothy's from Kansas, and Toto, too. And so I want to talk a little bit about Toto. Toto is like my power animal, along with Hazel. Uh, and um, in the scene that is the pivotal scene in the film, I think, it's one of them anyway, uh, Dorothy and Toto and their supporters are appealing to the Wizard of Oz to get help to allow her to go home to Kansas. And the wizard is not cooperating. He said, do not, do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. The Oz has spoken. Well, right then, Toto walks over and pulls back the curtain. Then the wizard says, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. And that's a tremendous archetype for what each of us can do. We can pull back the curtain on what? We can pull back the curtain to expose fraudulent ideas, false ideas, false ideologies, the abuses of power, as in the case of the movie. Pull back the curtain on deceptions. The um, crucial thing about Toto as a power animal and pull back the curtain as an archetype for what we can do is to flesh it out, is to make it more specific. And um, I do, I do want to point out that this, uh, this idea of pulling back the curtain, you know, has a, there's a particular way of answering that question I posed, you know, which is how can we use new thinking to affect the solution to the existential crisis. That's the key question I think we have to answer. There are lots of categories of answers. But one of those answers is to do 
for the world, for our time, what Charles and Myrtle Fillmore did in their time. They completely redefined almost every important concept in Christianity. And they were persecuted for it. They were considered a cult. There were lots of people that gave them a hard time. And in creating new thought, they exemplified something that we can follow. I saw an interview. I think this, this idea needs to be fleshed out. OK, it's one thing to think new thoughts, new types of thinking, get in groups, amplify that thinking. But how do we do it? What is the essential skill or attitude? Well, I ran into an interview that a mentor of mine did uh, about six weeks ago. Uh, Noam Chomsky is his name. Has anybody heard of Noam? So I've known Noam for 32 years. I sought him out, and I know him, and he's been a mentor of mine. It has nothing to do with me. He's generous with people who seek to learn, extraordinarily so. He's 91 years old, and he still takes 20 hours a week to answer emails, probably. So he did this interview. And uh, Nathan Robinson of Current Affairs Magazine asked him, how do you think? Now, Noam revolutionized cognitive science and started the cognitive revolution, writing a book review by, of a book by B.F. Skinner in the 1960s. Uh, and he's, he's gone on to, to really pull back the curtain on foreign policy. Uh, he is the most cited living author in arts and humanities. There are other people who are in the top 10. He's number eight, but all of them have died. You know, people like Freud. Marx. Uh, so he's, he's, he's an amazing living individual. And he said this, because, so this is, this is an insight as to how we can think new thoughts, the significance of it, and the attitude underlying it. He said, because your education instills into you the common sense of the day, it's very hard to break. But then he goes and says, but it's not really hard to break out of it. You have to be willing to do the kind of thing that led to modern science. You go back, say, to the time of Galileo. Just the willingness to ask yourself, look, everybody believes it. Is it true, he said. And so Galileo and his contemporaries made a breakthrough. They decided to be puzzled about these things. They decided to be puzzled about these things, confused, curious. Uh, as soon as you decide to be puzzled, you find that everything is wrong. There's a kind of rule of thumb. If everybody believes something, and it's a contentious issue, something should light up in your brain and say, you better ask about this. It's probably not true. As soon as you make that simple move, all sorts of things open up. Modern science opened up. So I, I transcribed that. I thought it was so cool. And I sent it to him. He wrote back and he said, glad you found it useful. Ability to be puzzled is quite useful, a quite useful one to cultivate, as history amply reveals, even if not necessarily good for your health. Galileo had a few problems, I seem to recall. <laughs> well, he didn't suffer the fate of Gordano Bruno, who's actually burned at the stake for heresy, but he was, Galileo was convicted of heresy and put under house arrest for saying that the Earth was not the center of the universe, that we revolved around the sun. And he was convicted on the basis of a passage in Joshua where God said the sun went across the sky. So uh, he became a heretic. <clears throat> so how do we cultivate this attitude of the radical reconstruction of society? <clears throat> Thinking new thoughts to pull back the curtain on concepts that are false, that are blocking important things like the popular will, blocking 
important things like <clears throat> the prevention of war, blocking important things like financial power of a society to pay for the very radical reconstruction that is required for us to save civilization. How do we pull back the curtain and, and here's the technique, deconstruct concepts and the terms that represent them and create new concepts and new terms. It's like the global war on terror in order to, to defend America. Well, if I had to pick a concept to replace that, it would be the global rule of law in order to create a level playing field all the time uh, for all across all the nations in the world so as to enforce international law as it is on the books. Article 4.2 of the UN Charter says it prohibits the threat or use of force. Even the threat is a crime. Yet every American president says all options are on the table. And nothing happens. Even though that treaty is the supreme law of the land, according to 6.2 of the Constitution. So there are lots of things that we can challenge. I want to focus on one, which is financial power. I uh, did, I've been thinking about modern monetary theory, MMT. Has anybody heard of that or read about it in the news? It's a macroeconomic theory that has been adopted by Stephanie Kelton and a number of other economists. So I contacted Randall Ray, who was looking for reframing MMT, and I found um, <clears throat> that he had an interest in a conversation about what I thought were mistakes that they were making with their concepts and terminology. And so, <clears throat> In a, uh, so we had a 50 minute conversation last Monday and he liked what I was saying. So he sent me a, a book and I took a chapter and I rewrote it with the new terminology. Part of it was <clears throat> changing budget deficit to a net spending surplus. Budget deficit is <clears throat> uh, typically more spending by the government than tax, taxes coming in, but the government spends money and creates dollars by using keystrokes these days. So the government doesn't need taxpayer money to fund anything. Big secret. So you can call it a net spending surplus. Uh, that changes everything. Because then, when we spend more in than is taken out of the economy by taxes, and we keep doing that, the so-called national debt becomes something else the national savings. It's a complete reframe. So I don't trust my own ideas about that. I need confirmation, so I talked to Randy about it. I sent him this thing with that and a number of other definitions, and he said, I agree with everything you say about debts and deficits, and as I edit the book, I will see how the substitute wording works. Well, he also said, can I bring Stephanie Kelton into the conversation? I said, okay. For me, that's a big deal. So that's one example. <clears throat> Any one of us can deconstruct concepts that form the narrative that prevents solutions, be it political will, be it warfare, be it financial power, be it anything else that we need. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is that this idea of deconstructing concepts is something you've done many times before. You know, think about when you've thought, could that be right? Is there another way of thinking about that? So rather than saying I'm delusional, say maybe I'm onto something here. How can I flesh that out, study, ponder, look deeply? So I'd like to conclude with a little meditation on these ideas to propose a way for those ideas that you're interested in to move out into your life. And I don't know if the musicians are coming up before. You can start to come up if you like. As you ponder, as we all ponder, our capacity to think differently, 
our capacity to engage in new types of thinking. Think about when you leave church here today. You'll be going out into many contexts, into many situations, into the many roles that you occupy. Notice the opportunities to amplify and extend your ideas in coordination with others. They may be key individuals, they may be professional associations, important groups, your role as an employee or an employer, your social media activity, your uh, role as a citizen of the most powerful country in the world, and more. These are all areas of your life where you can be like Toto. You can pull back the curtain wherever you see something that might not be true, to expose lies and deceptions, anything that might be immoral or unproductive, anything that gets in the way of the transformation that we needed, the radical reconstruction of society, and you can reveal the truth in doing so. Thank you. <laughs>